increasing focus has been uh, for the last 10 years or more on climate change in the Arctic and the impact that that's having both on the people who live there but also what change in the Arctic means for the rest of the planet. You should think of the Arctic as the world's refrigerator. When there's a lot of ice on the, uh, around the North Pole on the sea, the, the globe's climate is cooler. And now that the ice is retreating, melting, um, this is due to the warming temperatures, of course, but it creates a feedback loop that helps increase uh, the rapidity of change around the world. And so we're seeing glaciers melting in Greenland. We're seeing uh, sea level rise in the, from that in the rest of the world. We're seeing coastal impacts. There's been some discussion here at the conference already about potential coastal effects in Latvia ultimately, not necessarily from Greenland, but it's all part of a larger process. So the work that we've been doing at GRID is uh, through a project called Many Strong Voices, which connects people who live in the Arctic with people who are living in other so-called vulnerable regions like small island developing states. And we bring these people together and they look at ways to adapt to the changes that are, that are already happening. This is not something that's going to happen in the future. The rate of change in the Arctic is double the rate of change in the rest of the world. So the temperature has increased twice as much there as it has, say, here in, in Riga. Climate change is a real emotional issue as well, and you often hear um, people in a discussion, do you believe in climate change? It has nothing to do with belief. You know, the facts are in, there's no more discussion about is it happening, is it not happening? It's happening, so we need to act rationally in our own long-term self-interest, and everybody needs to be involved in that. We produced a number of uh, very short case studies of solutions that work in different places around the world. Um, looking at some cities, mostly in Europe, and how these uh, decisions were implemented, how they influence, how the policy was developed that influenced these decisions, and so that was our, our contribution to the book. You need to think about how to work collaboratively, and uh, I think this project that I mentioned earlier, Many Strong Voices, is an example of that. We bring people from the Arctic and from, you know, so places like Greenland and places like Tuvalu, uh, together to sit down and talk about what is it that we're trying to accomplish here and what have, what have we learned from each other. So this kind of project that, that uh, we've been involved in here is really important because it's actually getting people out of their own little areas of discussion and, and building the kind of collaboration and information networks that are really necessary. So that's, a, that's an important first step. And then we have to recognize as well that change is happening. I think one of the big challenges is to recognize that um, climate change is something that's happening to everybody, and it's happening right now. It's not, a, it's not a future problem, and it's not a problem that's going to be fixed by technicians. It's not going to be fixed by, by politicians. It really requires a collective solution, and so for people to understand that requires education, and it requires um, an understanding of the common interests we have as human beings across regions. So really, it's, it's a fundamental ethical and moral question. Um, so you need that basis to begin thinking about solutions. So there's a real issue here of process, of people having a right to participate. And underlying that is a, is a, is a fundamental concept of human rights. And that's now being discussed in the context of the climate change negotiations. So you have that happening at an international level.